Thank you for listening to a Sunday morning sermon from First Christian Church. For more information about these sermons or FCC in general, visit us online at FCCFlora.com. All right, after the 70s series, the, the only complaint I got was last week, and it was the complaint that there wasn't going to be more music. So I hooked you up, all right? So a little intro there. So keep everyone happy as we get going here. But uh, we're excited today to start a new series of foundations. And, and when I say excited, it's like genuinely excited. Like for me, like I don't sleep a lot anyway, but last night I couldn't sleep beyond that. I was too excited and I kept looking at the clock and I'm like, is it six o'clock yet? Is it six o'clock yet? Can I get up? And about two o'clock, I was walking around the house trying to waste time. And I'm thinking, praying to God, I'm like, hopefully one of these boys wake up because I'm bored. And about four o'clock, Link woke up and I'm like, yes, someone to play with, right? So and then he fell right back to sleep, so it didn't work out. But So I've been, I'm excited for today. I'm excited to share this with you. Thank you to the elders and just the time as they came and said, we'd like to pray over this as we begin to look at what it means to continue to build the church. And build the church is essentially that we're here as partnership with us and the other churches in town in this community that we're building the kingdom here. We realize that as we come together and we share, there's one kingdom being built here. It's not the kingdom of First Christian Church, or First Kingdom of Methodist Church, or First Kingdom of the Naz- um, It's the kingdom of God here. That, that we see our role as a church and our mission in this to join together. And so we're excited about that today. So as we get started, would you go on the word of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord. That God, that we, we see the need for the future of the church, to see the need for the calling that you place upon the local church. In, in grand scheme of the Big C Church, so we can partner together and share and facilitate to carry out your word, God. So today I pray, God, that these words would be yours, God, that you would speak it in a way that, that's clear and precise, that God, you, you enter our hearts and our minds, that God, you'd allow us to see and to, to comprehend. And we thank you for the amazing things that you've done and the, the mighty works of your hand, that God, we would not lose sight of that, but continue to push forward because of those things. And so God, through all things, we want to give you the glory. And it's your name we pray. Amen. For many of you, you know that as I, I grew up, uh, as I went through high school and I went through junior high, I was a nerd, all right? Like, not, not the pinpoint things, but I was in band, but I was also a mathlete. Yes, that's a real thing, right? And so growing up, my grandma was a math teacher, so I was in every math class I could be in because it came easily to me. I was around it all the time. And so I went through every math class. I got to high school. I was in the advanced math classes coming in. And then I found out there's drafting classes on top of that. And so now I'm taking every drafting class and every math class I can get all the way through high school. And as I went through this, going into our senior year, they're building a new school, right? And so as we got to it, halfway through at Christmas break, it was the day we finally get to move into this new school, right? I went through three and a half years of a school with no AC, so it was super hot, all in the fall and all in the spring. And in the winter, we had one of those water radiators that you couldn't control, so it was still like 95 in the building all winter long, you know what I'm talking about? And so literally, like, probably my junior and senior year, I think I wore pants to school twice because I could walk the 15 feet in the cold to get inside and sweat all day. So I was like, it's okay. But my goal in life as I was going through high school was to be an architect. It was my dream. Everything was lining up. I've taken every draft class. I've taken every math class. And even going into the spring semester of my senior year, my teacher's like, come here, there's about two of us in this advanced drafting class, and you're like, you have a meeting tomorrow, you need to miss class, and to meet with the architect. You guys are in charge of landscaping the new school. So we met with the architect, we got to sit down, and we were in charge of drawing the landscaping for the new school. And so I knew leaving high school, I was like, this is my calling, this is where I'm going, this is the vision for my life. And then my parents got involved. I love them. Hey, you should go to Lincoln. You can have a safe start and play basketball. Architecture or basketball? Winning basketball, right? So I followed the, my second dream, being a superstar. That didn't work out. I got hurt. But I got to Lincoln, and I loved it. And I wanted to stay there. It was home. And so I kept going through this. And eventually, I had to kind of start declaring a major that Lincoln had, because they didn't have architecture. And eventually, God continued to soften my heart in directing me. And I realized that while I still had vision for my life, my vision has changed. And it's okay for vision to change. It's okay to see a need for things to take place, but it's not okay for you to run out of vision. 
to run out of direction for your life, to, to go astray and, and to wander. And vision for your life it looks in many different directions, whether it's for your family and the goals that you have, the things you want to accomplish and become, or maybe it's just in your business that you run and the way that you, you want to handle those things. Or maybe it's part of the, the teams or your groups that you're with all the time, your friend circles. Uh, this is what we desire to be. And so vision has many different views. But what we understand is the need and desire to have vision for our lives. Vision is often described as the preferred destination, that what you desire to become, to be, you have to have that in your vision. And so as a church, as a building the future, we have to revisit our vision, to, to examine it, to understand the core principles of the church, to understand this. Now, I don't know about you, how many of you are like the plant people? Like you really like to like garden or you have plants around your house and you're really good at watering every day, the right amount that you need. We are not. We are not the plant people, right? Don't ask Jess and I to watch your plants because they always die, right? Yeah. If you go by our house, you're like, man, their flowers look really nice. They're fake, right? I have to redo them every year because we can't water them. We don't have that kind of commitment and that time to be like, did you water the flower? Like, we don't ever say that. It's not in our vocabulary. And if we do, it's like, hey, let's give them a lot of water so they can drink for the month. And then they still die. So we try to think ahead and be thoughtful and then we still kill them. But we understand the need and the time it takes to pour into it. You got to pour this water into it and care for it. You have to be intentional. In the same way for your life and for your teams, your groups, your work, and your church, you have to be intentional about vision. Because what we understand about vision is it can leak out. Like, like let me show you here. These buckets are, are full of water, but the top one is a lot like your vision, Right? And when you pour in there, we understand that vision leaks. And if you're not willing to keep pouring back into it, your vision will run dry. Coaching metaphor for you. Because at the beginning of every season, what do you do? You cast vision. This is what we long to be. This is the team of the future. But if you don't keep going back to that, if you don't keep hitting on it, by the end of the season, you've drifted away from that. You're not who you desired to be. The same way in our own lives, you ever think like, I've, I've never leaked my vision. Uh, New Year's resolutions, anybody? January 2nd, anybody, right? Like, I've got big plans for this year. It's gonna be my year. January 2nd hits, well, I've leaked all my vision out already, right? February hits, yeah, I'm just bone dry. I've got nothing poured back into that vision of whatever I plan to do, it, it's empty. And so we see a need and desire for us to continue to pour into our vision as a body, as believers together that we say, yes, this is what God is calling us to be. And so we begin to see this and we see a need for this and we see it in Proverbs 29, 18. To not let our vision leak out, to hold strong to it. And it says this, where there's no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who eats wisdom's instruction, that we're willing to listen, to, to call out to it, do you understand that wisdom, wisdom helps lead us and that vision helps guide us to that moment here? And so as a church, our, our vision is a compassionate community of reproducing Christ followers. Now this vision here, and our, it leads us right into our mission that if we're doing these things, if we're a compassionate community of reproducing Christ followers, we will now understand our calling that we exist to make disciples who make disciples. But what I love about that longing is in our vision there is it says that we are a compassionate what? Community, right? In our vision, we are a compassionate community. And while you're thinking, you don't like the disciples making disciples part and the reproducing part. What I love about this is that we are a compassionate community, that we understand that it's not just us, that we are part of the bigger picture, that we are here as part of our community, as a church, that we are able to build the kingdom up and not us up. To, to, to build the kingdom. We should celebrate in others' victory, in others' successes. They say, I've returned home. Another lost child is found. To God be the glory. That we exist in community with God's kingdom. And because of that, we are now able to make disciples. Make disciples. To share in that together. Because of that, we're pouring back into the vision of what God has laid upon the church. I, I use this illustration in in our online video, that's just a promo for this series, River. And, and I, we've talked about this in our small group this past year. And we were talking about faith and what it means and, and what's the next steps. And, 
When you begin to unfold, you begin to look at it, to think about it like this, like you're building a house or structure, and the church's role is that of the foundation. Now, you've probably heard of something like, I have a foundation. I'm okay. You know, the story of, well, my foundation is secure. It's on solid ground. I'm good, right? We've heard these stories since we were a kid. That's the problem. They haven't grown since we were a kid, right? Statistics say that 60% of people will leave the church once they graduate, not to return. That's the saying, the 40% that stick around are going to go in and out. That we understand the calling and the need for us to have a foundation. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were to build a house or structure, let's put it in this for circumstance for you so you can see it. But if you're going to go build a house, you're like, we got to pour our foundation. You go out and look at the foundation, you're thinking, this is awesome. We have a foundation. This is progress. We love it. Well, then you come back 10 years later. Are you still excited that you have a foundation? Right? Or would your spouse be elbowing you all the time? I need walls. I need walls. I have to have walls right now in a loving and encouraging way, right? But see, we see a difference that in our lives, if we were building a house, we're like, we want the foundation. We want the walls. We want it constructed right now. But when it comes to our faith, we're like, well, I have a foundation. I went to the science school classes. I went to the youth group. I have a foundation. I'm good. And we come back years later with our kids so they have a foundation. But God calls us to something so much more that we begin to live our faith out. We begin to construct our faith. So while we might grow in a foundation, God longs for you to want walls, to build up upon that, to share in that. And then while walls are great and it looks pretty from the outside, you, you want it finished. You want to move in, to dwell there, to live there. And that's where we begin to see our vision take place for the church. And when what we see God lead us in, and so many people say, we love the arrow. We love the idea of the arrow. It's awesome. And I'm glad that you love the arrow. It wasn't my intention. It just kind of how it came out. Once again, I'm a math person, right? So to be one, it's three thirds, our groups. To disciple, to be focused in and to share that everything points forward to the kingdom of God. So thinking about this way, if we're looking at the next several weeks, the foundation, the walls, and the interior, let's put it in real terms, the church, your life, and the community. And when the church begins to excel, when we begin to build walls in our own lives, we begin to contain our faith, and we begin to thrive in our faith and live it out. And just like a mirror, whenever you see a reflection that when we go out outside these walls, we begin to live all those things out to the church and your life and to the community, we begin to leave a reflection of Christ. That's one. That everything points forward to the future of the church. But we see a big need and a strong desire to, to build this foundation. So today we're just going to be looking at just that foundation, that moment. But just like any good foundation is built on concrete. We've got some guys bringing out some concrete. We're going to pour a foundation today. As we get started here, and I'll, I'll tell them when to pour here, but we're going to build a foundation. But here's the thing. A good foundation is what? Concrete. It's easily accessible. It's maintainable. It doesn't catch on fire. It doesn't rot. It doesn't rust. Why? Because we have all those things there. It's made through three simple elements, water, sand, rock, or gravel. You have a little bit of cement in there. That all these things combine together to make a solid stance. Something that you can continue to build your life upon. So for the church, the foundational purpose, the simple key ingredients that we have is this. That we understand that as the church in 1 Timothy 3.15 says to us, God's household, which is the church, and the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth, that church is the pillar and foundation that we begin to stand upon, that we understand, that we can continue to seek out, that our God, the creator, spoke to us in his experience to put us into place that you and I together would be part of this story to share together. And he says that, but you have to begin to lay it out to understand what is the key component to your life and what you're going to stand on. He sees that we lead it forward, that he continues to remind us in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 
that you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. And which is so ironic as we're using an illustration about building and foundations and walls. He says, none of this matters because you are the body and not this stuff. This isn't the body of Christ, the walls, the mortar, the sandstone outside, but you and I together are the kingdom of God. The revelation, the change in this world happens not because of the walls, but because of the people in it and because of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of them. And so we begin to see this take place and the second ingredient is Jesus Christ, a gift from our Father in heaven. But Ephesians 5 says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Colossians goes on 118. It says, he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So then everything he might have supremacy. Jesus is the church. Jesus is the core, the root of all things that we believe, that he gave himself for us. He was fully God and fully human. He gave himself. He came here humbly to die on the cross, to take the wrath that you and I rightfully deserve so we can stand upon our faith and declare our God as king. And so the church of God is built upon these key components here. That you and I are surrounded by love and grace and forgiveness that has been brought out from our ash, brought out from our dirt. That we might stand on his core. We have to have those key ingredients as a church. To understand our God the Father, the pillar of our faith, the truth in righteousness, to understand Jesus and his love for us and his sacrifice to begin to stand. But here's the thing. You can put all those components together. You can stir them around and mix them up. But until you actually begin to pour those things out into your life, they're nothing. We have to begin to pour it out as they will do get going here now. But we have to understand that the foundation of your life has to be a priority. It has to be a point into... Whoa. <laughs> it has to be a priority into your focus, into your desire. You're okay, right? All right. <clears throat> no liability claims this week. We're good. Okay. But we understand the need we actually have to put it out there. But see, so many people are like, I've got those key ingredients. I, I've been to church. I, I've heard about the stories. I, I've listened in. And then it's like, well, I just put it in this bucket, I've stirred it around, and I just watch it sit. And God says, yes, the church is the foundation, but you and I, we begin to pour the foundation. We're part of a story together that lays it out there for us. And begins, once we get it out there, we begin to see each key component. You begin to see the gravel and the sand that's all mixed together, the water, that all these things together begin to build the foundation of our principles, that we understand all these things together are the church. So we can see that together. So we ask ourselves this question, well, then who are we? What, what, what is our foundation look like? What are those little bitty pieces if it's all off this truth, the pillar of strength from God? Well, we understand our, our calling to the kingdom is through the local church that we share together in this. And we see that just like the church then, we anoint leaders and elders we, we, we need Paul and Barnes in this community. We need Paul and Barnes who are willing to stand up and pray for our leaders. Acts 14, 23 says, Paul and Barnes appointed elders for them in each church and with what? Prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord and whom they had put in their trust that you will receive your nomination letters soon. You'll be part of the process that we go through each year that we should be prayerfully considering who we put in those roles. Not because it's convenient, not because I can circle it real fast, but who have you prayed for? Who have you been partnering with this? We see in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. As a church in the body, we understand that the word of God is powerful and it is mighty and it changes lives. Well, it helps you grow, it helps you learn, or even better, it helps you change. He talked last week, we don't like that part there, that change part. That, that part that says, is it punishment or is this discipline? That God would take you and say, I'm going to correct you. I'm going to pull you back. But he's pulling you back to the body. Back to that foundation. Back to the principles of which it's something that you can stand upon. 
We see that there's a principle of which it's God that 1 Corinthians 8, 4 says, we know that in idol and in everything and in all the world and that there is no God but one. That there's gonna be many things that present themselves to you in this life that look like God's. That present like things that I can live my life after that. Many temptations, many desires, but there's only one God. Do not be mistaken. And as a church, we wanna stand upon that. The truths of our foundation that as there's one God, he has caught us all together. He spoke us into his sins. He's pure in spirit, worthy of our praise, mighty and powerful. And he chose you and I. And he longs for us. And he gave his son, as 1 Peter 2, 24 says, he himself bore our sins in the body on the cross that we might die to sins and live in righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Jesus was hailed as the Messiah, the, the chosen one, the one that was to come and to spare us. And he left us with his spirit. That he gave us this gift, not only of eternal life, but he says, I'm leaving you with something better than my presence. What could be better than the presence of Jesus in our midst? It's the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. The same power that raised him from the dead now lives inside of us. That we might be mighty, that we wouldn't back down, we wouldn't cower down by our faith, but we'd stand firm upon the foundation of the truth of God, that he dwells and lives inside of us, that he is still alive and he was coming back again. We may not forget this. And that Holy Spirit we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 10, verse 11. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God that we're able to communicate with God and share and partner in this together. We're able to communicate and open up. But now we need to see the calling for the church, a calling to stand upon the foundation. Don't just pour it out there. Don't just accept what it's about. We got to start stepping upon it. We see this take place for us. And so many times in life, it's easy just to step down than it is to step up. It's easy to take a posture of fear and cowardice in a position of faith and boldness to declare that anything that you face, you can stand tall in righteousness. See, I will declare God through this, no matter what I'm going through. Last week, we ended the story with King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he was coming after God's people as they're being punished that God sent King Nebuchadnezzar to Jerusalem to destroy his people's place. And this is where they were God's people. And yet they had turned away. Their kings had led them astray and he sent them in to bring them back. And in these moments, they went through this and they were taken out of their place. They're taken out of Jerusalem back to Babylon. They're, they're, here, come over here. You're gonna be over here. You're gonna be exiles now in this wicked place. And Jeremiah kept warning them about all these idols, about all their worship and all these things they're encountering. And they kept asking the same question. God, what can you do in this place? You're going to do anything in this darkness? See, they were afraid to stand in faith. Now, I won't stand on the foundation today because it's wet. But for many people, we just kind of walk around the foundation. We, we, we circle around and we tiptoe and I, I, I know I need to step up into this, but I, I don't know, God. And then we begin to look around us. Well, what else is going on here? Well, there's darkness over here and there's trouble over there and I, there's worry in my heart and anxiety in my mind. And, and Jeremiah tells him, and probably one of my favorite verses in Jeremiah 29, actually, but it's one that's hard to handle as well. And it's this. 29 verse 7 says, Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. As they're sitting there crying out to God of God, what are you going to do here? What could you do in the midst of this darkness? What could you do in the midst of all that is taking place here? Jeremiah reminds them that you were the light into the darkness. That just like our arrow, it's the reflection of Christ which is going to light the way. Not the simple works of you and I. But it's when God takes hold of those and blesses them and uses them for his kingdom's sake. But the funny thing is, when we think about where we've been placed, and sometimes we feel like outsiders and exiles, and 
But he says, if they prosper, you prosper. Well, that means I have to step out in faith myself. I have to, don't cower down, but I have to stand up. I, I have to go forward. And what's amazing here in this is that we are f- fearful of this verse here, verse 7. But just a couple of verses later is a verse that we rejoice in. Some of you might have it in your homes or some you've declared all the time. But let's read it together. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That same promise that we declare in verse 11 is the same thing that we ran from in verse, right? That we ran from here that we're we're saying, I don't want a part of that. What can he do here? And then yet here we are singing his praises of what he could do in our lives. So as a church, as a foundation, as we begin to stand upon this, don't back away from what God could do through you. What God could do through this church, through this body, to bring and to cast his kingdom here. But he says that we all have to be in faith. Don't let our vision dry up. Don't drift from that. But today we have to begin to stand on the foundation of faith in our lives. To what that looks like for you. To commit ourselves to be in the church that is built upon the truth of God, the pillar of his strength. To take the knowledge that we have and understanding and let our belief take life. Let's go together. That we are called together to live this out through our church in our life, in our community. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we, th- we thank you, Lord. I, I know as we, we see this and we, we understand that the many struggles that w- we see in our lives in the darkness and just like the Israelites, God, they question, God, what are you gonna do here and, and how could you move? And God, I pray for an awakening in our hearts that God, you're ready to move through us. And God, we might have a lot of different stories today. And God, we might have some who who have never even focused on the foundation. They they didn't even know the ingredients to the foundation to build it. And that's the church and through your word and through your truth, your son, Jesus, and his sacrifice. So God, today I pray for those that are able to find this, that they're able to focus in and and begin to pour out their own foundation of faith, to to be able to see the key ingredients, to focus in on those. God, I pray for those who who've probably poured their foundation years ago, but yet have never come back to begin to step upon it, to begin to build upon it. That that God, that you would use their stories in a mighty way as they begin to build walls, to begin to to allow their faith to take life, not just words on a page, but their life song, their story. And for God, those who, who have been there, but have just been standing on the foundation, For those, God, who've got walls, who begin to, who need to learn how to dwell inside as we look in the coming weeks, that, God, you would continue to challenge their hearts. That, God, that we'd be a community that is built on your truth, built on your foundation, that is ready to move in this world. To be part of our community, to be a difference maker. That, God, wherever we go, you are seen. As we are a compassionate community reproducing Christ followers who are willing to go and to ask to invite and to share into your kingdom in your name we pray amen if you please stand sing it's our, our time of decision here but what's so amazing about the foundation of the church is when you have your own foundation at home your, your, your own area that, that's mine that's mine But when you build your foundation into the kingdom of God, it's our foundation together. And we should be inviting others into that that area, that space. And as Jeremiah writes, he reminds us that when they prosper, you prosper. That when we share, the kingdom celebrates. As we pour out ourselves, understand that there's people in your lives that need that same hope that are longing to be told that they're important. And it's probably that same person you invited 12 times already and you're like, I've tried. But the one that needs it one more time. They need you to ask him just one more time. 
What if that one more time was the time they said yes? What was that one more time? That was the moment they truly experienced God's love in a real way. Because you stepped up on your foundation in a posture of faith to build the kingdom of God. And God continue to move us forward.